In the first act of Shakespeare's Julius Caesar, he makes Cassius say the following words. The fault, dear Brutus, is not in our stars, but in ourselves. It goes on, we are weaklings, but I don't want to go to the weaklings. <laughs> I want to just talk about the contrast between the fault being in our stars or in ourselves. And I pick this theme because we are living in a summer of discontent in South Africa. I don't just mean the heat and the drought and the racism and the rand. But by the way, it is also a tough season elsewhere. Yesterday, the Financial Times reported that this January has been a disaster for stock markets, which have internationally never fallen so far as and so fast in a January on record. I want to talk to you about an idea. It is an idea that says we will only emerge from these troubles if we could somehow repeat the miracle of 1994, but this time for the economy. The turmoil of the last few weeks have brought two new versions of these ideas back into circulation, with Clem Santer publishing an example of the first version when he argued for what he called an economic codesa. And here is what he wrote uh, in, widely in a widely circulated opinion piece. He says, we achieved political freedom without economic freedom. And that is a very dangerous mixture, particularly at a time of low economic growth. We never completed the job, and we still have economic apartheid dividing the haves from the have-nots. No presidential council of business advisors meeting behind closed doors with government ministers is going to resolve the basic problem we have of widespread exclusion from the formal economy suffered by townships and rural entrepreneurs. We need to start creating an inclusive economy right now. However, he says, the final document of this, of this deliberation, this economic kudesa, should be as sacrosanct as our constitution, with measurable outcomes that can be tested in a court of law. At the core of this argument, is the claim that our current disappointments and frustrations can be traced causally to the negotiated political settlement of the early 1990s. Sunter reminds us that the American Revolution did not end with the creation of the United States as we know it, with a federal government and a political system that divides power between President, Congress, the Supreme Court, and the states. Instead, what emerged from the American Revolution was a loose confederation of 13 states with the central government in Congress that had such limited power as to render it not only ineffective, but practically irrelevant. It was the evident failure of this arrangement in the course of the 1780s that allowed statesmen like James Madison and Alexander Hamilton to build the case for a new start, the Constitutional Convention of 1787, which eventually gave us the modern United States. What this new constitution created was a federal government sufficiently empowered that it could assume over time the role of a modern state. It is true that the Americans started over in 1787, after they had set up a government with inadequate powers to govern the envisioned republic. The new constitutional uh, convention certainly defined the powers and limits to power and set out the rules to guide conduct in American society. It did not, however, determine social outcomes, remove poverty, or reduce inequality. The claim that a constitutional convention can create, in Santa's words, an inclusive economy right now that encourages widespread participation in the wealth, in the wealth creation process misrepresents fundamentally the level of abstraction at which the basic rules of a society are made at constitutional conventions. Unlike the Articles of Confederation that caused all that trouble in the United States, we in South Africa have an excellent modern and very progressive constitution. Other commentators have argued that the trouble of 1994 was not this sin of omission, but a sin of commission whereby the ANC, uh, the ANC alliance uh, in the negotiation process 
agreed to a series of mistaken principles and policies which have hamstrung us ever since. If you follow this line of reasoning, as Patrick Bond recently did in the Mail and Guardian, we must now, in his words, reverse the damage by undoing these deals. And here's a collection of the deals he has in mind. Here they are. The first deal, mistaken uh, transaction, was the repayment of foreign debt. The second was formal independence for the Reserve Bank. Third, borrowing from the IMF. Fourth, retaining Derry Keyes as finance minister and Chris Stahls as governor of the Reserve Bank. Five, joining the World Trade Organization on supposedly adverse terms. Six, the reduction of corporate taxes. Seven, the partial privatization of state-owned enterprises. Eight, the gradual relaxation of exchange controls. Nine, the adoption of the GEAR framework for macroeconomic policy. 10, the protection of property rights in the Constitution. 11, allowing Old Mutual and Sunlum to demutualize. And 12, allowing some South African corporates to move their primary stock market listing to international markets. But my fundamental problem with this second line of criticism against our polit political transition and the, and the call for the reversal of damage is that they are all an attempt to deny that policymakers face real choices hard trade-offs on matters such as industrial policy and fiscal policy. It is a narrative in which we argue that our troubles have been written into our stars, into a political legacy, instead of acknowledging that there are real challenges that we face in our society because of the real flaws in our decision-making and because of the continuous failures of our society to collaborate productively and progressively, both in government but also in business and also in the social sector. It is a narrative in which academics pretend that social outcomes follow magically from policies without working through social processes. When GEAR was adopted, our country faced a dire fiscal crisis and the then government could not step away from its responsibility to face the very real trade-offs required to overcome that challenge. Likewise, the prudent monetary policy of our Reserve Bank reflects the reality that artificially low interest rates or printing money offers no route to sustain prosperity. What makes monetary policy difficult is that you have to focus on an important goal, the long-term goal of low and stable inflation, while at the same time realizing that in the short term, those decisions will have consequences for economic activity and employment. As business leaders, you will face very many real decisions too, where taking one opportunity will mean foregoing another opportunity, and adopting one strategy will limit your options elsewhere. We would fail as a business school if we did not remind you constantly of these real decisions, and, I, and if we did not give you the analytical tools to understand your choices and the leadership capabilities to manage their consequences. The narrative that there are both constraints and opportunities in society, and that in our, in our subject matter, we understand the contours of many of these incentives. Our National Development Plan does not deny this narrative. Instead, it shows us the real choices that we are likely to face in our society over the next 15 years. And it also proposes incentives to help us make the right choices. But the National Development Plan does not deny our history, nor the impact that many regrettable decisions in our past have for the current prospects of our society. We must acknowledge this historical perspective without falling into either of the two false narratives about, about the political transition that I have criticized this evening. The one being the claim that our constitution is somehow flawed, and the other claim that the, other the, claim that the important policies were somehow the result of a new liberal compromise or horse trading, without which it would have been so much better at this point in time. By contrast, I am extremely encouraged by government's very recent initiative, announced yesterday, under the leadership of former President Khalema uh, Motlante, to review the unintended consequences of all post-1994 legislation. With this initiative, Government is not blaming the unintended consequences of these laws on their stars, or on the late President Mandela, 
or on something between Ruth Mayer and Joe Slovo in Kempton Park. With this initiative, government is strengthening the narrative that our faults lie in our own society and in the choices we make collectively. And I hope you will do the same as business leaders when you leave the business school. Thank you very much. Just to say that um, I thought to start this evening in my short word of welcome to all of you to, to list a few good news things about USB. The first thing, Mr. Dean, I can announce already this evening, that in every single of the courses that was mentioned by our Director of Marketing, we have exceeded our budgeted target. Therefore, this is how our business model works. USB is fully subscribed for the year of 2016. We are oversubscribed. That is a great asset. <laughs> um, second piece of good news is that we start with two imaginative new programs already have started last week. One is our brand new MBA that we have co-designed and redesigned completely. It's much more leaner. It's, it's sharper, it's more focused, it's now a professional master's degree, and our academic staff worked extremely hard last year to prepare for this. It has kicked off Marlies, I think it has started well. I think there are four streams, and uh, we are so excited that this new MBA, we were worried about the market because it's suddenly higher requirements to enter the degree, but it seems that uh, people have responded very, very well. The other program was already mentioned, and this is that we negotiated with Stellenbosch University, the main campus, uh, under the leadership of our dean, uh, to bring over to USB this year the postgrad diploma in financial planning. I welcomed them last night. It was a full um, uh, venue, more than 100 students that qualified for that after a, a stringent selection by our colleague that in the front here, Prof. Neil Krieger. We're very excited about these two new programs that will extend our our suit of academic offerings and will add to the diversity uh, of the business school. Thirdly is we are uh, appointing four new staff members this year. Uh, two of them already arrived and um, if the other two are foreign nationals, uh, excellent academic staff. We have a relatively small contingent of full-time staff at USB, so to add four members of staff is a significant growth on our human capital and we're very, very excited about that. Fourthly, we will um, spend a bit of money on our buildings. Then we, we, we have a, a mission at, at, at USB to participate in public dialogue. The things that the Dean spoke about. That we understand that the destiny of our economy and our personal lives are not somewhere in the stars, but actually in our own reach and responsibilities. And lastly, colleagues, uh, I can go on, is that um, the news now has uh, come that at the moment as we stand here this evening, USB is the only school on the African continent with a full-term European quality assurance accreditation of five years. We are now really, in terms of that one specific criterion, we are a school of high repute in Africa. We are proud to be that. Shall we give a hand to our colleagues who have been I want to conclude by welcoming our students. Um, I'm very happy to see you here. I also met a number of you already uh, in the passages, uh, a number of students from different countries in the world. Uh, I practice my German and a little bit my Dutch. It's lovely to have you guys here. And I just want to repeat at this beginning of the year what we stand for. We last year went through a quite a, a rigorous uh, uh, rethinking of our identity and also our strategic objectives. And our identity is simple. We are proud to be an African business school rooted here in South Africa, but also on the African continent, addressing the kind of questions that arises from the economic and the social questions in this continent. But we will do that at a level that is globally reputable. And that tension between local relevance, relevance understanding the locality, but always in conversation like good academics would do with our colleagues around the world. That is how we see ourselves. And this is why our mission is to develop responsible leaders 
a very much a loaded word in today's uh, global economic responsible leaders through our well-grounded uh, business education and research. We also decided to adopt very clear values for our school. I'd like to point out three of them. One is that in a society where there's a blurring of the lines around what is good and what is right and what is corrupt and what is wrong, where we reward behavior that would normally be seen as not in line with the law or with the mores of our society, we have accepted integrity and transparency as a value. A second value that is very important, and the Dean referred to that very cursorily in his remarks, in South Africa at the moment we are living through an upsurge of, I would call, um, implicit racism that become overt, specifically in the social media, if exclusivity becomes the norm in which we agree or not agree with one another. And that's why our second value is inclusivity. And I want to state it very publicly tonight, and I include myself in that, and I say this to the Dean, who's our leader and representative of Stellenbosch University. We shall not tolerate on this campus any form of racism. We shall not tolerate any form of genderism or sexism. We shall not tolerate xenophobia or any feelings of discomfort for people who are from different places geographically and so forth. In fact, to put it positively, Stan, we will simply lift the Constitution, the sacred document of 1994, Act 106, 108 of 1996, probably the most important document in the modern history of South Africa. That is what we want to live here. We might make mistakes. We want to do research on the experiences of some of our students who don't feel the inclusivity here. And we're part of Stellenbosch University that is struggling with our history and our past. I was part of that. But we have to model academic communities that embody the principles of our constitution. And lastly, the last value, there's more, but just for the sake of this evening to welcome you here, is excellence. And we simply describe it is that we benchmark uh, against the best. I do believe that to be a university, you are part of a universe of scholars. And therefore, you are subject to the peer review of those in your own continent, in your own country, but also those who live in America, for that matter, in China or India. Uh, or Latin America, so that we are part of a global community of excellence. That is what USB is standing for. With those few words, I welcome you at USB at an exciting year. We start with very, very good news. We're off to a fantastic beginning. Uh, let the energy that I feel with you and that our director referred to earlier, let that flow into our classrooms, into our cafeteria. May that change us to become the people that the dean has called us to be. It lies within ourselves. Thank you very much.